Segment 17a, Muscovy Becomes Russia. In this lecture, the Rus culture rises from its wreckage first in Vladimir Suzdal, and then in an unimportant, insignificant trading post on the remote Moscow River. The trading post and its small wooden fort or Kremlin was so insignificant that Prince Alexander Nevsky bequeathed it to his youngest son. Somehow, this obscure trading post managed to become the Grand Principate of Moscow. The last Grand Prince of Moscow was also the first Tsar of Russia, Ivan IV, better known as Ivan the Terrible. In segment 17b, Gathering the Lands, we trace the unique relationship between the Grand Princes of Moscow, beginning with Ivan I, better known as Ivan Moneybags, and the Mongol Golden Horde. The Grand Prince's tactics were not particularly moral, but they worked. By hook, or by crook, or by both, the Muscovites gathered the lands which eventually formed the Russian heartland. We will also see how, under Ivan the Great, the Muscovite state began to think of itself as the Third Rome, and heir to the legacy of the Byzantine Empire. Segment 17C, Ivan the Terrible, introduces us to Russia's first czar and one of history's most fascinating psychopaths. Despite his miserable, tormented childhood, there were positive achievements early in Ivan's reign, including Russia's first Zemsky Sabor, or Council of the People. Early on, Ivan won two wars over the Kazan and Astrakhan Khanates, making Russia a multinational empire with religious tolerance. But then he descended into madness. The most outstanding product of his madness was the creation of a police state called the Oprichnina, ruled by Ivan's bloody henchmen called the Oprichniks. His attempts to win Russia a window on the Baltic Sea were a bloody and costly failure. Ivan created the Rom Russian Empire, and he almost destroyed it. In segment 17D, Time of Troubles, Russia wallows in the aftermath of Ivan the Terrible's highly mixed reign. This time is often known as the Time of Troubles. Exhausted psychically and physically from Ivan's internal and external works, the Russian people survives three false Dmitris, two foreign invasions, which happened at the same time, no less, and the famous Boris Godunov. One might think of the time of troubles as a Russian national gut check, no, not unlike the Roman Empire's crisis of the third century AD. But just when all appears to be lost, the peasants and the nobility hear the Russian Orthodox Church's call, and they drive the hated invaders out. This sense of unity involved in this process is best described by the term Holy Russia. Unfortunately, the feeling did not last for long. Segment 17b, Gathering the Lands. The face of Eastern Europe began to change in the 1300s AD. In the first place, the Mongol Empire and its spin-off, the Golden Horde, were starting to disintegrate. The Golden Horde had watched happily as the major Rus principalities were shattered by the practice of appanage. Now, in the 14th century, they depended on the Russians themselves to collect tribute and to help them fight off invasions from the West. We've already mentioned the invasions of the Swedish and the Teutonic Knights, both stopped by Prince Alexander Nevsky in the 1240s. More dangerous yet was the pagan principality of Lithuania, which had recently converted back from Christianity. Under Gediminas Elgirdas, 1345 to 1377, Lithuania built a huge empire reaching from the Baltic Sea south to the Black Sea. In 1386, Lithuania entered into a personal union with the Kingdom of Poland and reconverted back to Catholicism. The Lithuanians and their Polish allies were a constant threat to the Mongols and the Rus alike. 
To add insult to injury, this joint Lithuanian-Polish empire now controlled Kiev and its entire area, the heartland of the Rus culture. Moscow was founded as a trading post on the river of the same name in 1147 AD. The Golden Horde had sacked Moscow in 1238, but exerted little influence there because of Moscow's remote location. This helped. It also helped that Moscow's princes did not tend to go appanage crazy, thereby keeping Muscovy in one piece. Another Muscovite strong point was the inborn sneakiness of Moscow's princes. When Prince Ivan I, Moneybags, ruled 1325 to 1341, became, got the Jarlik and became the Golden Horde's tax collector, he added to his personal income by overtaxing everyone else, especially those neighbors whose land he wanted. Ivan Moneybags also enticed the Russian Orthodox Church to set up its headquarters in Moscow, thereby giving Moscow even more prestige. Ivan Moneybags' grandson, Dmitri, ruled 1359 to 1389, rebuilt Moscow's fortified city center, or Kremlin, in stone, just in time to fight off two different Lithuanian invasions in 1368 and 1370. Dmitri was pleased with his own success. He stopped paying the Mongols tribute, even though he probably kept collecting it. He just didn't give it to the Mongols. In turn, the Mongol general Mamai invited Muscovy, invaded Muscovy in 1380. A smashing victory over the Mongols earned Dmitri the nickname Dmitri Donskoy, Dmitri of the Don. This also earned Moscow a return visit from the Mongols in 1382, this time under a more capable general called Toktomish. Dmitri knew which fights to pick and which not to. He made peace with Toktomish, and in return he was reinstated as Grand Prince, complete with the Jarlik. But on Dmitri's death in 1389, his son Vasily I was crowned Grand Prince without consulting the Golden Horde. This is important because it marks the beginning of Muscovy's rise and the serious decline of the Golden Horde. Vasily I ruled Muscovy until 1425, keeping up the family tradition of gathering the lands of others whenever possible. Meanwhile, in southern Russia, the Golden Horde was all but polished off by the Mongol conqueror Timurlane, or Timur the Lame. Yet the Muscovites were not themselves immune from civil war. Vasily I was succeeded in 1425 by his ten-year-old son, Vasily II, who was forced by his uncle and cousins into a long, bitter civil war. It took young Vasily II 25 years to establish power. In the meantime, he had been captured once by the Mongols and blinded by one of his cousins. In 1453, the Byzantine Empire fell, and the Patriarch of Constantinople gave his blessing to Metropolitan Jonah of Moscow, acknowledging that the Russian Orthodox Church was now entirely independent. The fall of Constantinople in 1453 also created the notion that Moscow was destined to be the Third Rome, after Rome herself and Constantinople. In 1462, Vasily II's son Ivan III came to the throne, hoping to add to what his father had left him. Ivan's brothers tried to horn in on the heritage, but Ivan III had learned from his father's adventures, and he suppressed his brothers ruthlessly. In 1471, Ivan III fought a war with the Republic of Novgorod, because Novgorod had allied themselves with the heathen Roman Catholic Poles. 
After another war, in 1477, Ivan III annexed Novgorod once and for all. He exiled many of Great Novgorod's leading families, starting up a practice of ethnic cleansing, which would continue for centuries, and he also nipped in the bud the fragile flame of Russian democracy. The most important event of Ivan III's reign was his formal refusal in 1480 to pay any more tribute to the Golden Horde, which was by now just a loose alliance of smaller hordes. The Golden Horde's last Khan, Ahmed, made a token attempt to make Ivan III pay the tribute. But their two armies just camped opposite each other until winter came. When winter came, both sides went home. Although Ivan III's glorious defeat of the Golden Horde was duly commemorated with paintings and sculptures and medals and poems and music, the Mongol occupation actually ended not with a bang, but with a whimper. On the other hand, Ivan III made drastic and genuine changes to the Russian state itself. Ivan was ably assisted by his second wife, the Byzantine princess Zoe Palilogoga, who took the orthodox name of Sophia. Their marriage in 1469 marked the conversion of the Grand Duchy of Moscow into the Russian Empire. Under Sophia's influence, Ivan III imported Byzantine artists and architects to make his capital a worthy third Rome by building such masterpieces as Assumption Cathedral. He also adopted elements of Byzantine iconography, such as the double-headed eagle, along with Byzantine rituals dating back to the old Roman emperor Diocletian. Finally, Ivan III started referring to himself from time to time as Tsar, or Caesar a term Russians had previously reserved either for the Byzantine Emperor or the Khan of the Golden Horde. Accordingly, Ivan III ruled in a strictly autocratic fashion. He refused to take advice from his boyars or nobles. On the other hand, he was very concerned with the rule of law. As the Byzantines had based their legal code on the collected laws of ancient Rome, so, Ivan III collected ancient Rus laws into a document he called the Sudebnik, S-U-D-E-B-N-I-K. The Sudebnik expanded on Yaroslav's old Ruskaya Pravda code by spelling out exact legal procedures to be used throughout the Muscovite state. Although this did help the rule of law, don't forget that the law was based upon the will of Tsar Ivan III. To avoid the old problem of division by appanage, in 1502 Ivan took as co-regent his son by Sophia, Vasily III. Ivan III's success in making Moscow center of the Russian world and a worthy successor to Constantinople justly earned him the title Ivan the Great. Succeeding as Grand Prince in 1505, Vasily III inherited the family program of extending Muscovy's boundaries by the gatherings of other people's lands. For the most part, Vasily succeeded, but he had less luck fighting off the pressure of powerful boyar families such as the Shwiskis. Vasily III sent off the boyars into exile and then he sent off potential supporters of the boyars, echoing the autocratic approach instituted by his daddy, Ivan III. Although Vasily III ruled for 28 years, he left behind only one heir, a three-year-old son, Ivan Vasilyevich, who became famous as Ivan the Terrible. Segment 17C, Ivan the Terrible. Grand Prince Vasily III, son of Ivan the Great, died in 1533. Vasily's widow, Yelena Glinskaya, 
served as regent for their three-year-old son, Grand Prince Ivan IV. A strong personality by all accounts, Yelena was an active regent, but her gender and her Serbian-Lithuanian descent offended the Boyar families. The Boyars had suffered under the autocratic rule of Ivan III and Vasily III, so the powerful Shuisky family led the Boyars in making life miserable for Yelena and her little family including apparently poisoning Yelena in 1538. The Shuiskis would likely have killed young Ivan IV also, but they couldn't bring themselves to harm the descendants, supposedly, of Rurik. So instead they started killing off young Ivan's family friends, including one poor soul who was skinned alive in a Moscow square. By age 13, however, young Ivan decided to take control of his own life and his own country. At his command, the boyar Andrei Shuisky, who had once dared to place his muddy boots on Ivan's bed, was thrown into a cell of ferocious and hungry dogs. On January 16, 1547, Ivan had himself crowned at the Cathedral of the Dormition, not as Grand Prince of Moscow, but as Tsar of all the Russias. The 17-year-old with the sad upbringing would rule his country on his own terms. Total domination. And this he did to such an extent that he became known in Russian as Ivan Grozny, translated into English as either or both of Ivan the Awesome or Ivan the Terrible. For someone who had endured such a wretched childhood and who had become one of history's greatest despots, Ivan started his reign on a positive note. In 1547, he married a boyar's daughter named Anastasia Romanovna, whom he loved and honored to her dying day. In 1549, Ivan flirted with democracy by summoning the first Zimsky Sabor, an assembly of nobility clergy, and townsmen. Although Ivan intended the Zemsky Sabor as a mere rubber stamp for his plans, even pretending to listen to the people was more than any of his predecessors had ever done. In 1550, Ivan revised the Code of Laws, or Sudebnik, started by his grandfather Ivan the Great. On the whole, Ivan's reforms were a positive step for everyone but the poor peasants, who now found it even harder to leave the land that they worked on. In 1551, Ivan began to show a decided conservative streak. He called a council of the Russian Orthodox Church to purify the Russian Orthodox religion of outside influences. In 1559, Ivan published the Domostroy, a restrictive guide on every aspect of proper Russian family conduct. Ivan IV, Ivan the Terrible, also furthered the family tradition of gathering other people's lands. Early in the 1550s, he established the Strelzi, or Shooters, a body of highly trained gunmen recruited from the lower classes which served as Russia's first standing army and was commanded by the Tsar. The Strelzi played an important part in Ivan's two great conquests, the Khanate of Kazan in 1552 and the Khanate of Astrakhan in 1556. So pleased was Ivan with the first of these victories that he ordered the building of the Cathedral of the Intercession on the Mound, better known even in Ivan's time as St. Basil's Cathedral. St. Basil was a wandering holy man who shoplifted every day his daily bread and once even dared to rebuke Ivan himself for not paying enough attention during church. People even said that Ivan had the architect blinded so that he would never again create anything so beautiful. To this day, St. Basil's Cathedral is probably the world's most famous and familiar Russian church. 
Tradition also has it that the Russian people gave Ivan the nickname Grozny, meaning the awesome, after his victory over Kazan. In 1558, Ivan started the Livonian War, hoping to get Russia a port on the Baltic Sea. This effort bogged down into a long, bloody draw, and the port in question would not be built until the time of Peter the Great. At some point in the 1550s, Ivan began to morph, if you will, into Ivan the Terrible. In 1553, Ivan was deathly ill. Thinking he might die, he asked the boyars to swear loyalty to his infant son. The boyars refused, no doubt, recalling what a wonderful little kid Ivan himself had been. When Ivan recovered, he convinced himself that the boyars had wanted him to die and put his cousin on the throne instead of him. In 1560, Ivan's beloved wife, Anastasia Romanovna, passed away. Ivan convinced himself that the boyars had poisoned her, just like they had poisoned his mother. Ivan began to torture and execute the boyars. Even some of his own closest advisors came under suspicion. In the early winter of 1565, Ivan crossed the line into madness. He suddenly left Moscow and announced that he was abdicating or giving up the throne. Since the masses wanted Ivan to remain as Tsar, and the boyars were afraid to get in the way, Ivan agreed that he would continue to be Tsar, provided that he, Ivan, could reform the Russian state as he pleased. Ivan's instrument of reform was Russia's first secret police organization, the Oprichniks. Recruited from Ivan's followers and other hardened criminals, the Oprichniks roamed Russia on horseback, wearing black robes, carrying their unique emblems, a broom, and the head of a dead dog. Any disloyalty to Ivan, real or imagined, was punished by death. Entire cities were put to death, including in 1570 the city of Great Novgorod. The Volkhov River literally ran red with the blood of slaughtered Novgorodians. This was a wretched time for Russia, her first, but unfortunately not her last, reign of terror. Ivan the Terrible was not Russia's only problem. In 1570, a plague ravaged Russia, really. The Lithuanians and Swedes swooped in from the north and the west as did the Tatars, that is, the old Mongols, from the south, along with the Ottoman Turks. The Tatars even burned Moscow down in 1571. That shock was enough to bring even Ivan the Terrible to his senses, if temporarily. He disbanded the Oprichniks in 1572 and resumed trying to do his job seriously. The Livonian War dragged on to the northwest, the Russian treasury was in ruins, and Ivan had by this time remarried so often that the Russian Orthodox Church no longer considered his marriages legal. In 1581, Ivan got into an argument with his pregnant daughter-in-law when his son, the Tsarevich Ivan Ivanovich, stepped in to protect his wife. Ivan killed him. From that point on, Ivan lived in and out of madness until his death in 1584. Some say he was either strangled or poisoned by his advisors, including his in-law, the boyar Boris Godunov. Despite the damage Ivan did to Russia domestically, his conquests had made Russia into a true empire. The Tatars of Kazan and Astrakhan were not forced to adopt the Russian language, not forced to convert to Russian orthodoxy, not even forced to dress and speak like Russians. Their lands were not taken away and awarded to Russians. In fact, Tatar nobles intermarried with the Russians as if nothing much had happened. 
At the tail end of Ivan's reign, enterprising Cossacks also began to explore Siberia. The Russian Empire would be multi-ethnic, multilingual, and would have multiple acceptable religions. Compared to the attitudes of contemporary Western conquerors like Cortez or Pizarro, Ivan the Terrible was an amazingly humane empire builder. Back after this cough drop. Segment 17D, Time of Troubles. To this day, Russians still aren't totally sure what to think about Ivan the Terrible. Ivan took autocracy to an extreme. Ivan's crimes against humanity are well known and properly reviled. Ivan let Russia's peasants become serfs during his reign, thereby ensuring a backwardness which persists to this day. His attempt to gain Russia a port city on the Baltic Sea cost many lives and accomplished nothing. But, on the other hand, Ivan's victories over the Kazan and Astrakhan Khanates not only expanded Russia's eastern territories, but established a sensible plan for assimilating these people into Russian life, if not necessarily into Russian culture. Toward the end of Ivan's reign, he oversaw the exploration and conquest of Siberia, which would provide the Russian state with unbelievable riches. Perhaps it is best to say that Ivan was Grozny in every sense, terrible, dread, and awesome all in one. Ivan was succeeded by his simple-minded son Fyodor. His youngest son Dmitri was only two years old at the time. But the true power behind the throne was Fyodor's brother-in-law, Boris Godunov. As Fyodor's counselor, Boris Godunov followed many of Ivan's initiatives in a more pleasant way. The Tsarevich Dmitri had died in 1591 under suspicious circumstances. When Fyodor died in 1598, the line of Rurik's male descendants ended. The Zimsky Sabor, or Popular Assembly, was once more summoned, and this democratic institution selected another Tsar, this time Boris Godunov. As the new Tsar, Boris Godunov made a promising start. He made peace with Russia's northern enemies and tried to bring Russian education closer to Western standards. But he ran into bad luck. Famine struck very hard in 1601 and in 1602, causing the survivors to wonder whether Russia had somehow offended God. The boyars were definitely offended. Taking orders from a descendant of Rurik was one thing. It was quite another thing to have to obey a feral boyar who had merely married into the royal family. Boris, for a while, managed to keep his haters in check until he encountered his nemesis, the kind of character that only Russia seems able to produce. False Dmitri, number one. As early as 1601, false Dmitri No. 1, whose real origin is lost to the centuries, was going around Moscow complaining to be Dmitri Ivanovich, son of Ivan the Terrible and his wife Maria. False Dmitri No. 1 was arrested but escaped to Poland where he converted to Roman Catholicism. The Poles were happy to help him out just as they were able to, happy to help anyone out who hated Russia. In 1604, false Dmitri No. 1 marched against Russia with a motley crew of adventurers, Polish mercenaries, and Cossacks. Cossacks were peasants who had escaped serfdom by running so far into the hinterlands that Russian justice couldn't find them. Even so, False Dmitri No. 1's chances of success were less than zero until Boris I, that is Boris Godunov, took ill and died in April 1605. 
Boris's son was crowned at once as, as Tsar Fyodor II, but the boyars murdered him, deciding they'd rather have a false Dmitri than a real Godunov. At first, the new Tsar Dmitri, he didn't call himself false Dmitri, obviously, ruled Russia well enough, but he soon showed his true colors. He displayed a passion for everything Polish and married a Polish princess who hadn't even bothered to converting to Russian Orthodoxy. For once, the boyars and the peasants were in complete agreement. Dmitri had to go. After a reign of ten months, false Dmitri was trapped in the Kremlin and shot after trying to jump out of a window and escape. The boyar, Vasily Shuisky, was from the same Shuisky clan which had tormented young Ivan the Terrible, was elected as the next czar. False Dmitri's remains were cremated and fired back to Poland out of a cannon. By this time, revolution was in the air. Peasants and boyars alike rose up all over Russia, sometimes with each other, sometimes against each other. And while all these uprisings bubbled up under the surface, false Dmitri No. 2 appeared in 1607. The widowed Mrs. False Dmitri No. 1 greeted False Dmitri No. 2 as her long-lost husband. They even had a child together. For a while, the two czars ruled side by side. Vasily from Moscow and Tsar False Dmitri No. 2 from a nearby town. Finally, Vasily called in the Swedish army, which cornered and defeated False Dmitri No. 2 at the very center of the Russian Orthodox Church, the St. Sergius Trinity Monastery north of Moscow. But there were no winners. If you thought all that was confusing, what follows is even worse. At least you didn't have to live through it. The Swedish army holed up outside of Novgorod and installed false Dmitri number three as Tsar with predictable results. Meanwhile, Poland presented another threat. The Polish king decided to take advantage of Russia's weakness by conquering Western Russia. He also decided he would make his son, Prince Władysław, the next czar. Sadly, many Russian boyars supported this move, preferring to be ruled by another king, even if it was a Polish king, than to be ruled by either the peasants or somebody named Dmitri. <laughs> At this point, on the verge of national disintegration, the Russian people did something kind of wonderful. The inspiration came from the Russian Orthodox Church. The leaders of St. Sergius Trinity Monastery called on all Russians, rich and poor alike, to drive out the invaders and save the Third Rome. Under the leadership of the merchant Kuzma Minin and the soldier, Prince Dmitri Pozharsky, the Russian people literally rose up and drove all the foreign troops out of their country. By September 1612, the army of Minin and Pozharsky was at the gates of Moscow. On November 4, 1612, Moscow was captured and the Zimsky Sabor was summoned once again this time including even peasant representatives, to elect a new Tsar. Although Prince Pozharsky was regarded rightly as the savior of his country and was supposedly descended from Rorik, he stayed out of the election. The Russian people needed a free choice for their next leader, and Pozharsky would not complicate the choice. A statue of Minin and Pozharsky stands in Red Square to this day. And in 2005, the Russian Federation began celebrating November 4th as the Day of National Unity. Segment 17E, Conclusions. 1. The Secret of Moscow's Success. In the first place, Moscow, like Rome, 
was blessed with a good defensible location. It was far away from the Mongols, and it was close to both river and land transport, which made trade possible. Next, the Muscovite princes tended not to produce multiple male offspring, which kept their land unseparated. Finally, there was the utter unscrupulousness of Moscow's grand princes. They sucked up to the Golden Horde to keep the coveted Yarlik, and they hung on to as much of the tribute money as they could. They picked off minor principalities one by one and worked their way up to the big cheese, Novgorod the Great. Once the land was gathered, whether conquered, inherited, or purchased, the new territory became, like everything else, the property of the Grand Prince. The upper classes had it easier than the peasants, but everything and everyone was the property of the Grand Prince, or later the Tsar. Two, all the king's men. The upper classes had their discontents. Nobles, especially the wealthiest nobles called boyars, were expected to produce, provide the Grand Prince with troops. In return, they were supposedly allowed to have enough land to provide them with a necessary livelihood. This was often not quite enough for the boyars. The Grand Princes trans traced their ancestry back to Rurik, but they were a very ju junior branch of the Rurik family tree. Some of the boyars came from far more important branches and did not appreciate being ruled by a lesser branch. More to the point, the boyars actively despised the Grand Prince's autocratic rule and centralized government. Seen in this light, Ivan III's marriage to a Byzantine princess and his adoption of Byzantine court rituals seems like an exercise in self-preservation. The boyars wanted more of a voice in the state and sometimes they got it, as when Ivan the Terrible was a pup. But they didn't keep it for long. The Opechnina was primarily designed to terrify the boyars into submission. And it worked. Three, <clears throat> rule of law and the class system. In Russia, the law seems to have been used as something to keep the various classes in their places. Most notably, it became harder and harder for serfs to relocate from one master to another. Due to the climate, Russian farmland was neither abundant nor fertile, and it didn't really produce enough to let peasants live comfortably. Ivan the Terrible was the first to send explorers into Siberia, but the mass settlement of Siberia, such as it ever was, was pretty long off. Aggrieved peasants could always escape south to join the Cossacks. On the fertile steppe land of what is now Ukraine, the Cossacks lived in freedom under an elected hetman. They combined a love of farming with a love of fighting, sort of an agricultural version of America's wild, wild west. Yet the lower classes got at least a little bit of respect. When Ivan the Terrible formed Russia's first standing, un standing army, the Streltsy, in the 1550s, they were recruited from the lower classes because the lower classes were considered more loyal. And for all that, the peasants actually preferred to be ruled by an autocratic monarch. Four, Holy Russia. This was the high point of the Orthodox Church's influence on Russia. First, Orthodoxy was the religious faith of almost all Russians, the Muslims of the conquered Kazan and Astrakhan Khanates being the one exception. As the masses of peasants embraced Orthodoxy, Orthodoxy became Russian to meet their unique spiritual needs. We'll explain the consequences in the next lecture. Second, Orthodoxy was a unifying force in Russian political life. When Russia seemed doomed to crumble under the Swedish and Polish invasions, the call from resistance came out from the St. Sergius Trinity Monastery. Miraculously, 
the union of peasants, nobles, and Orthodox Church drove the invaders out, proving the existence of a unique Russian national identity. But was Russia truly the third Rome, destined to bring, bring peace and Orthodox Christianity to, to the world? We'll find out.